org. The Fur Country by Jules Verne. Part Two, Chapter Fourteen. The Winter Months. The party did not arrive at Fort Hope until the twenty-eighth, after a most arduous journey. They had now nothing to depend on but the boat, and that they could not use until the sea was open, which would not be for six months. Preparations for another winter were therefore made. The sledges were unloaded, the provisions put back in the pantry, and the clothes, arms, furs, etc., in the magazines. The dogs returned to their dog house and the reindeer to their stable. Great was the despair of Thomas Black at this return to seclusion. The poor astronomer carried his instruments, his books, and his manuscripts back to his room, and more angry than ever. With the evil fate which pursued him, he held himself aloof from everything which went on in the factory. All were again settled at their usual winter avocations the day after their arrival, and the monotonous winter life once more commenced. Needlework, mending the clothes, taking care of the furs, some of which might yet be saved, the observation of the weather, the examination of the ice field. And reading aloud were the daily occupations. Mrs. Barnett was, as before, the leader in everything, and her influence was everywhere felt. If, as sometimes happened, now that all were uneasy about the future, a slight disagreement occurred between any of the soldiers, a few words from Mrs. Barnett soon set matters straight, for she had acquired wonderful power over the little world in which she moved. And she always used it for the good of the community. Kalumaha had become a great favorite with everybody, for she was always pleasant and obliging. Mrs. Barnett had undertaken her education, and she got on quickly, for she was both intelligent and eager to learn. She improved her English speaking and also taught her to read and write in that language. There were, however, twelve masters for Kalumaha. All eager to assist in this branch of her education, as the soldiers had all been taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, either in England or in English colonies. The building of the boat proceeded rapidly, and it was to be planked and decked before the end of the month. McNab and some of his men worked hard in the darkness outside, with no light but the flames of burning resin. Whilst others were busy making the rigging in the magazines of the factory, although the season was now far advanced, the weather still remained very undecided. The cold was sometimes intense, but owing to the prevalence of west winds, it never lasted long. Thus passed the whole of December. Rain and intermittent falls of snow succeeded each other. The temperature, meanwhile, varying from twenty-six to thirty-four degrees Fahrenheit, the consumption of fuel was moderate, although there was no need to economize it. The reserves being considerable, it was otherwise with the oil upon which they depended for light, for the stock was getting so low that the lieutenant could at last only allow the lamps to be lit for a few hours every day. He tried using reindeer fat for lighting the house. But the smell of it was so unbearable that every one preferred being in the dark. All work had, of course, to be given up for the time, and very tedious did the long dark hours appear. Some aurora borealis and two or three lunar halos appeared at full moon, and Thomas Black might now have minutely observed all these phenomena, and have made precise calculations on their intensity, their coloration. Connection with the electric state of the atmosphere, and their influence upon the magnetic needle, etc. But the astronomer did not even leave his room; his spirit was completely crushed. On the thirtieth December, the light of the moon revealed a long circular line of icebergs shutting in the horizon on the north and east of Victoria Island. This was the ice wall, the frozen masses of which. Were piled up to a height of some three or four hundred feet. Two thirds of the island were hemmed in by this mighty barrier, and it seemed probable that the blockade would become yet more complete. The sky was clear for the first week of January. The new year, 
1861, opened with very cold weather, and the column of mercury fell to eight degrees Fahrenheit. It was the lowest temperature that had been experienced in this singular winter, although it was anything but low for such a high latitude. The lieutenant felt it his duty once more to take the latitude and longitude of the island by means of stellar observations, and found that its position had not changed at all. About this time, in spite of all their economy, the oil seemed likely to fail altogether. The sun would not appear above the horizon before early in February, so that there was a month to wait, during which there was a danger of the colonists having to remain in complete darkness. Thanks to the young Eskimo, however, a fresh supply of oil for the lamps was obtained. On the 3rd January, Kalumaha walked to Cape Bathurst to examine the state of the ice. All along the south of the island, the ice field was very compact, the icicles of which it was composed more firmly welded together. There were no liquid spaces between them, and the surface of the flow, though rough, was perfectly firm everywhere. This was no doubt caused by the pressure of the chain of icebergs on the horizon, which drove the ice towards the north, and squeezed it against the island. Although she saw no crevices or rents, the young native noticed many circular holes neatly cut in the ice, the use of which she knew perfectly well. They were the holes kept open by seals imprisoned beneath the solid crust of ice, and by which they came to the surface to breathe and look for mosses under the snow on the coast. Kalumaha knew that in the winter bears will crouch patiently near these holes, and watching for the moment when the seal comes out of the water, they rush upon it, hug it to death in their paws, and carry it off. She knew, too, that the Eskimo, not less patient than the bear, also watches for the appearance of these animals, and throwing a running noose over their heads, when they push them up, drag them to the surface. What bears and Eskimo could do might certainly also be done by skilful hunters, and Kalumaha hastened back to the fort to tell the lieutenant of what she had seen, feeling sure that where these holes were, seals were not far off. Hobson sent for the hunters, and the young native described to them the way in which the Eskimo captured these animals in the winter, and begged them to try. She had not finished speaking before Sabine had a strong rope with a running noose ready in his hand, and accompanied by Hobson, Mrs. Barnett, Kalumaha, and two or three soldiers, the hunters returned to Cape Bathurst, and whilst the women remained on the beach, the men made their way to the holes pointed out by Kalumaha. Each one was provided with a rope, and stationed himself at a different hole. A long time of waiting ensued, no sign of the seals, but at last the water in the hole Marbra had chosen began to bubble, and a head with long tusks appeared. It was that of a walrus. Marbra flung his running noose skillfully over its neck and pulled it tightly. His comrades rushed to his assistance, and with some difficulty the huge beast was dragged upon the ice and dispatched with hatchets. It was a great success and the colonists were delighted with this novel fishing. Other walruses were taken in the same way, and furnished plenty of oil, which, though not strictly of the right sort, did very well for the lamps, and there was no longer any lack of light in any of the rooms of Fort Hope. The cold was even now not very severe, and had the colonists been on the American mainland, they could only have rejoiced in the mildness of the winter. They were sheltered by the chain of icebergs from the north and west winds, and the month of January passed on with the thermometer never many degrees below freezing point, so that the sea round Victoria Island was never frozen hard. Fissures of more or less extent broke the regularity of the surface in the offing, as was proved by the continued presence of the ruminants and furred animals near the factory, all of which had become strangely tame forming, in fact, part of the menagerie of the colony. According to Hobson's orders, all these creatures were unmolested. 
it would have been useless to kill them, and a reindeer was only occasionally slaughtered to obtain a fresh supply of venison. Some of the furred animals even ventured into the encant, and they were not driven away. The martins and foxes were in all the splendor of their winter clothing, and under ordinary circumstances would have been of immense value. These rodents found plenty of moss under the snow, thanks to the mildness of the season, and did not therefore live upon the reserves of the factory. It was with some apprehensions for the future that the end of the winter was awaited, but Mrs. Barnett did all in her power to brighten the monotonous existence of her companions in exile. Only one incident occurred in the month of January. and that one was distressing enough. On the seventh, Michael McNabb was taken ill. Severe headache, great thirst, and alterations of shivering and fever soon reduced the poor fellow to a sad state. His mother and father, and indeed all his friends, were in great trouble. No one knew what to do, as it was impossible to say what his illness was. But Madge, who retained her senses about her, advised cooling drinks and poultices. Kalumaha was indefatigable, remaining day and night by her favorite's bedside, and refusing to take any rest. About the third day there was no longer any doubt as to the nature of the malady. A rash came out all over the child's body, and it was evident that he had malignant scarlatina, which would certainly produce internal inflammation. Children of a year old are rarely attacked with this terrible disease, but cases do occasionally occur. The medicine chest of the factory was necessarily insufficiently stocked, but Madge, who had nursed several patients through scarlet fever, remembered that tincture of belladonna was recommended, and administered one or two drops to the little invalid every day. The greatest care was taken lest he should catch cold. He was at once removed to his parents' room, and the rash soon came out freely. Tiny red points appeared on his tongue, his lips, and even the globes of his eyes. Two days later his skin assumed a violet hue, then it became white and fell off in scales. It was now that double care was required to combat the great internal inflammation, which proved the severity of the attack. Nothing was neglected. The boy was, in fact, admirably nursed, and on the 20th January, twelve days after he was taken ill, he was pronounced out of danger. Great was the joy in the factory. The baby was the child of the fort, of the regiment. He was born in the terrible northern latitudes, in the colony itself. He had been named Michael Hope. and he had come to be regarded as a kind of talisman in the dangers and difficulties around, and all felt sure that God would not take him from them. Poor Kalumaha would certainly not have survived him had he died, but he gradually recovered, and fresh hope seemed to come back when he was restored to the little circle. The 23rd of January was now reached, After all these distressing alternations of hope and fear, the situation of Victoria Island had not changed in the least, and it was still wrapped in the gloom of the apparently interminable polar night. Snow fell abundantly for some days, and was piled on the ground to the height of two feet. On the 27th, a somewhat alarming visit was received at the fort. The soldiers Belche and Pond When on guard in front of the encant in the morning, saw a huge bear quietly advancing towards the fort. They hurried into the large room and told Mrs. Barnett of the approach of the formidable carnivorous beast. Perhaps it is our bear again, observed Mrs. Barnett to Hobson, and accompanied by him and followed by the sergeant, Sabine, and some soldiers provided with guns, he fearlessly walked to the postern. The bear was now about two hundred paces off, and was walking along without hesitation, as if he had some subtle plan in view. I know him, cried Mrs. Barnett. It is your bear, Kalumaha, your preserver. 
"'Oh, don't kill my bear!' exclaimed the young Eskimo. "'He shall not be killed,' said the lieutenant. "'Don't injure him, my good fellows,' he added to the men. "'He will probably return as he came.' "'But suppose he intends coming into the encant,' said Long, "'who had his doubts as to the friendly propensities of polar bears. "'Let him come, sergeant,' said Mrs. Barnett. "'He is a prisoner like ourselves, and you know prisoners.' "'Don't eat each other,' added Hobson. "'True, but only when they belong to the same species. "'For your sake, however, we will spare this fellow-sufferer, "'and only defend ourselves if he attacks us. "'I think, however, it will be prudent to go back to the house. "'We must not put too strong a temptation in the way of our carnivorous friend.' "'This was certainly good advice, and all returned to the large room.' The windows were closed, but not the shutters. Through the panes the movements of the visitor were watched. The bear, finding the postern unfastened, quietly pushed open the door, looked in, carefully examined the premises, and finally entered the encant. Having reached the centre, he examined the buildings round him, and went towards the reindeer stable and dog-house, listened for a moment to the howlings of the dogs, and the uneasy noises made by the reindeer, then continued his walk round the palisade, and at last came and leant his great head against one of the windows of the large room. To own the truth, everybody started back. Several of the soldiers seized their guns, and Sergeant Long began to fear he had let the joke go too far. But Kalumaha came forward and looked through the thin partition with her sweet eyes. The bear seemed to recognize her, at least so she thought, and doubtless satisfied with his inspection, he gave a hearty growl, and turning away, left the encant, as Hobson had prophesied, as he entered it. This was the bear's first and last visit to the fort, and on his departure everything went on as quietly as before. The little boy's recovery progressed favorably, and at the end of the month he was as rosy and as bright as ever. At noon on the 3rd of February the northern horizon was touched with a faint glimmer of light, which did not fade away for an hour, and the yellow disk of the sun appeared for an instant for the first time since the commencement of the long polar night. End of chapter 14